This is Julia Whittup with Talk Story TV, and I have with me today Grace Walbrink, who is a storyteller and the author of a book on storytelling called Breakout Storytelling. Is that right, Grace? Absolutely. Okay, tell us about your book. Julia, it's an honor to be here. Um, and I, I would be thrilled to, to be able to do that, so thank you. Uh, breakout storytelling, and the whole idea basically came about is because I've had the tremendous uh, opportunity to work with uh, many different storytellers, and in, in my own journey as a storyteller, um, going to conferences and workshops and seeing other people go to conferences and workshops, they're wonderful and vibrant and magnificent, but sometimes coming back and not really knowing or feeling safe or confident within ourselves to express who we are and express that story and forgetting that story is not somebody else's words, but we are the story. Uh -huh. And so through, uh -huh. through the incredible, wonderful, delightful coaching of my daughter, um, we talked about and, and, and she supported me through the idea of an experiential guide to telling a story, to get rid of the complete sentences because because when we see things in writing, we, we tend to become attached. Like it really can't be said or, or done another way. Uh-huh. But that's literature. That's, that's the beautiful world of rules and grammar and structure that define the, the, the writing of our world today. But that really isn't who we are as a storyteller. That isn't really who we are when we talk face-to-face, heart-to-heart, like we're talking now. Um, and the other people in our lives. Because we don't speak and in so whole sentences. Sentences and. <laughs> Thank goodness! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> so it's like when we tell a story, who are we in that story? Let's experience it. Let's find out because we are the story. We're not a part. We're not a piece. We're not a segment. We okay. are it. And so how, how does the, so the book is not structured with sentences either? <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, thinking. Well, I tried, but <laughs> yeah, when, I, when I wrote it down, I, I you know, uh, there was um, some stretching, shall we say, of the laws of grammar. But yeah, they're, they're in, for the most part, complete sentences and grammatically correct so that, you know, the average eye can read them and pick them up. But as I developed... Uh, kind of this, this slender book, it was the idea of taking a story, whether it's personal or folkloric, but I took a folkloric one in nature, and going through what I think I have about nine or ten different steps of really stepping into the characters and the images and having them come alive because you are it. There's a part of you that's in that story. When you get into those images and characters and tell it in only the way you can, it becomes alive not only for you as the teller, but it becomes alive for the audience. Uh-huh. Okay. So each chapter has some exercises, and I encourage people not to put them in complete sentences so that we don't switch to the literary part of ourselves, but we, we keep ourselves present in the moment, in oral, and permission to let that story grow and become as we tell it to so many delighted listeners and audiences along the way. So each has exercises which you can draw out in images or write a few brief sentences on as you grow and step into your own story in only the way that you can tell it. Wow. And so um, how do you recommend that people break into getting gigs for storytelling? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really didn't address that part of the book. It was more the idea of just being able to go in and develop a story, whether you're professional or whether you're the person who's a part of a local storytelling guild that wants to develop and craft that story, that person that um, seems to, to have that uh, connection, rapport, or appeal to tell stories to their children, um, family gatherings, the Sunday school teacher, the school teacher. I'm also uh, a professional social worker. And I've used storytelling and crafting stories, which is part of how this came about, too, with my clients, 
in letting that process go because as we begin to learn and step into telling stories, it can take us to stages, it can take us to gigs, but it can also enhance other avenues in, in areas of our lives. And so my target was really for the person, whoever that is in there, that just wants to step in and take another level in, in crafting their story. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... So you don't recommend how they, where they might take that. They have to figure out where they're going to take it to. Right. It's just a, just simply an experiential guide and some steps to help help each of us step into the images and make that story ours. Okay. And um, where do, and so you're in a storytelling guild. Tell us about storytelling guilds. I have been completely honored and delighted to have, in, in years and years ago through my daughter, become um, involved with Story Spoons of Grand Rapids. It's a local guild for people who just love to tell stories. And through the incredible, delighted listening of so many members and, and watching people, and it didn't matter the skill level, it was, it was people getting out and, and stepping into the story and, and watching that grow and being a part of that community, that it stirred something within me to take my stories and to take what I was doing to a different level. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. So what does a guild do? They, they just take turns telling stories or what? You're, you're absolutely right. We, uh, right up, the story Spinners of Grand Rampage, we, we get around and it's a complete honor and delight. Again, people of all ages uh -huh. come. My, my daughter started telling stories when she was four through them. Uh-huh. And eventually became my coach and, and dances professionally with me and puts her original choreography around my storytelling or we work with groups of people combining story and dance. Um, other people share stories from their lives. Other people develop stories for the stages. So it's a group of people that get together that absolutely love stories. And we, we share stories and, and learn more about storytelling through newsletters and, and educational segments. But most of it is the community of people coming together to share their stories each month. Okay, wow. Okay, so when they make up these stories, or they read story, do they ever read stories? Uh, we keep that into the oral tradition that we tell stories. We don't. We don't do the reader's theater is wonderful and magnificent, uh -huh. but um, f uh, for our particular venue, it is is oral tradition. Okay, I understand. Wow, this sounds fascinating. So you, they can take your book and learn how to tell stories, practice on their family, and join a storytellers guild and practice on them. That's really not not even the point of the book. The point of the book is really some guilds don't require that. You know, our storytelling group it doesn't require any of that. And if you want to craft it, you can. Or if you just want to share an experience. That is just as wonderful and delightful as well. Um, again, back to the book and the intention. It is simply the person who wants to to step into developing an artful, well-crafted story. Okay. And, and again, that could be for a guild. That could be for stages. Um, in some sense, my own journey, I've always kind of been the storyteller. I was very honored to travel internationally and collect the stories of people that were in press countries um, and facing the challenges of war and poverty and, and violence in many different levels. And for, for some reason, people sought me out, and I didn't totally understand why at the time, and said, please tell her story, please listen, please let other people know. And so I would come back and I would share those stories. And did you record those, or how did you collect the stories? They're, they're still in my mind. They're still in my heart. They're still a part of me. Okay. Um, <laughs> that, that was way before I knew what a storyteller even was. Uh huh. I had encountered that so many times throughout my life, and then it was actually my four-year-old daughter that brought me in, you know, one of those stressed-out mom days. You love your kids, but <laughs> you need a new direction. <laughs> and so Story Spinners of Grand Rapids had this celebration going on in the in the local library. Oh, I didn't know what Story Spinners was. I didn't know what a storyteller was, and I didn't know what, you know, a celebration was. But hey, this was good. It was a place my, my daughter could be and I could be. And uh -huh. there were colors. It was this, this wonderful, small, intimate auditorium. My daughter sat, you know, in the center of, of the aisles 
right up in front, and uh-huh. I sat in the back row going, this is good. So I, <laughs> I was the only one back there. Life was good. We listened to these wonderful stories. A brand new experience for me. At intermission, she walked up, very social and outgoing, talked to the MC, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the MC's waving at me, and I'm waving back. Life is really good at that moment, and I'm nodding my head, and, and, and this is perfect. This is the perfect uh, take a mom break and have your child with you. Uh-huh. The program continues, and the next thing I heard, we have a special guest storyteller, and her name is Andrea Nightingale. <gasps> and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my four-year-old daughter! Oh my gosh, look at <laughs> I just agreed to let her tell a story. She's never been in front of a group. She's never been in front of a microphone. And my heart is now in my throat. I am sitting upright going, oh, my goodness, now what do I do? You know, there's an audience out here. There's, you know, I, I, you know a master's in, in, in um, social work, and I, I have a teaching degree. And, and so all my educational training is coming into to full play here. Uh-huh. And water gets up. And to my wonderment and amazement and shock and astonishment all rolled into one, she had listened to parts of all the stories that were told that night. And she crafted them into this miraculous tale about a whale that was without a home and how she was going to take care of the whale in the backyard. <laughs> and she had a blanket and a pillow. And it was a complete story. And I was awed and amazed. And through that moment in time, they gathered around her. And she was then the next year at five years old, invited to tell at... Um, the Grand Rapids Festival of the Arts, which is huge, one of the largest all-volunteer arts festivals in the nation. All different types of performances, and, and our local storytellers have a place there. Mm-hmm. And so at five years old, she had a 30-minute time slot to tell stories, but that was a little bit much for a five-year-old. <clears throat> and so um, she invited me to join her in telling stories in a way that I had never done before. And through that experience... Um, I was brought into an awareness because I thought at that time that a storyteller memorized stories out of a book. And so I'm dutifully memorizing the words of these these wonderfully crafted stories and literary tradition with their phenomenal pictures and, 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 and lettering and everything else that makes it so magical and enchanting. And I got up on stage and I did very good. I, I learned my lines and, and I was expressive and, and interactive enough um, throughout the years that I had gained rapport with the audience. Uh-huh. And, I, and I remember coming off stage, several people commented, thanked me for being there. And I remember to this moment in time, a gentleman, and I still remember what he was wearing, his white shirt, he had kind of brown pants on, very kind eyes, but he had that look on his face. And I thought, uh-oh. And he grabs a chair, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, two of them. And we go off to the side, and he says, I, I just really want to share this with you. He says, you've got something that I don't often see, but you have no idea what story is or what storytelling is. It has nothing to do with the words in the book. And then he got up and left. And I just kind of sat there. Oh, that's all he of, told you? <laughs> that's all he said. And I was like, um... I just kind of sat there. I didn't know what to do, where to go. And so I started to go into festivals, and I looked around in the local area, and I went to my first workshops, and then I learned the value and the truth of the words that he gave me and that he said, and it was the biggest gift that anybody could ever give me. And I realized that I was the story, that I was the script. I was every single part and player, and that it came from me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And words and books could give me ideas and inspiration, but they couldn't give me the story because I was the story. Okay. And so that's in part how this book became because I see so many other tellers, you know, we get scared. We all do. And we, the words on the page are secure and they're tried and they're true and they're wonderful, but they're somebody else's beautiful, wonderful creativeness. They're not our beautiful, wonderful creativeness. Fabulous. <laughs> and now you do little thing what do you every what do you call the little things you do with your daughter where she does dance and you tell story? Well, that's storyographers, but that, that journey took another turn after that. Which which ties it back together, which is um, I was doing outpatient therapy at the time <clears throat> and working with children that were in the foster care system, dealing with multiple levels of violence and in court appointments and and had seen police come in and take parts of their family away and and I remember working with this very large family they had 12 people in the family all separated it, it was just 
it was one catastrophe after another. They were in therapy five days a week. I guess it was Friday at five o'clock. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it was like an entire year, and I, I was getting to the point where it's like I really didn't know what to do, and it, I, I didn't know if it was for my sake or their sake or, or a couple of them, but I, I took this workshop as I continued my journey in storytelling, and it was story drama. It was, it was how to be interactive in your storytelling. Uh -huh. I, remember, I remember walking in, and now in family therapy, so I, I have an office full of people including the perpetrator, including everything that was going on. And I was like, I could not I could not endure one more routine day of not knowing what to do with, in being this analytical, critical person that was not working. Uh-huh. In time. And I said, you know what, folks? This is it. I said, you know, we have a situation here. And I looked at the family, and it really reminded me of the three Billy Goat Gruff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the hierarchy. It's who's ever the biggest and strongest, you know, the bullying part. It's like, that's the system. That's what they're dealing with. So I came in, and I said, guys, we got to talk here. We have a serious problem. I said, I, I have, I've got these, these, these goats over here in this troll, and they're bringing this case to mediation. And, and, and I need some help. And so I crafted the story of the three Billy Goat Gruffs, which was, was, you know, the material that we had to work with because they had to drive an hour into therapy. So I heard about the drive-in. So, so it, it had highways in it. And they were in foster care, so I put, put apartments in it because of all, you know, people coming and going in their living situations all the time. And I took, you know, children in, children in foster care and issues with hunger because hunger and food is intimacy in their whole life. I mean, they, they, they're not in their school anymore. They're not in their neighborhood anymore. They're not in their family anymore. Oftentimes, they're not placed with siblings, so they don't have their siblings anymore. And so they've been completely, in an instant, a flashing of a second, transplanted into this completely foreign world that now they have to start all over again, plus facing the trauma and the emotion and everything else and, and not having that close interpersonal connection to even begin to start the healing pr process until a little bit later down the road till that's reconnected and redeveloped. Mm -hmm. And so I put, the goats were very, very hungry. And because they had, had come from rural areas, they knew about sheep and goats. And I grew up in a farm, and I know about sheep and goats. I have my own sheep on resolved sheep issues, let me tell you, for a different <laughs> story. <laughs> sheep just destroy the land. They, they nibble everything down to nothingness. So I uh. crafted that in the story. So the whole story was based on the fact that they, they had these goats, and, and there wasn't any food because of the annoying sheep. Oh, and, okay. And then, of course, there was development coming in. There was the new apartment complexes, the new highway system. So all these things were encroaching on their, their sacred feeding grounds. And they looked over the bridge, and there wasn't all of that. There wasn't the apartment complexes, there were no highways, and thank goodness, no sheep over there. And so they had to cross the bridge. But, of course, the troll was not very accommodating in this and had a history of eating goats, which was not very nice for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and knowing that these children had experienced multiple levels of abuse, I didn't want to have too much physically or emotionally happen to any character in the story. Uh -huh. The goats came over, but they did, the, 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 the big billy goat did butt the troll, and the troll went so far and so high up into the air, he came down and just splash! <laughs> was so big, it created a wave, and it wiped out the bridge. <laughs> that was a huge problem because we have a homeless troll. Because everybody knows that trolls live under bridges. And we have right. And so I said, okay. So I, my anticipation was to have everybody pick a character in the story and from that character tell how we were going to resolve this conflict of the budding trolls, the, the threat of, you know, carnivorous, or the budding goats, the threat of carnivorous trolls, and the homelessness and the lack of food. So, so we could pick any of those issues. And this whole group got together. The perpetrator picked the annoying sheep. Oh, my gosh, if I had sheep shears, I would have used them on the spot. <laughs> And I had the kids say, you know, I'm going to be um, the judge, and, and I'm going to, to, to be the police officer, and I'm going to be the police chief, and I'm going to be the lawyer, and I'm going, oh, my goodness, I have a courtroom. This <laughs> one's <laughs> <laughs> not a litigation here. But I thought, okay, they're with me. They're excited. I'm excited. And so I let go of it, just like a good storyteller does. At some point, you craft and develop your story, but then you let it go. 
And so, and then the most amazing thing began to happen. They were so into the images of the story. <clears throat> They took that story and suddenly they were building a forest that was next to the housing complex. Okay. And that the stream actually went through the forest. And in that forest, they were aware of the fact that the people in the apartment complexes had the tools and things that they needed to build bridges. Okay. I thought, oh my goodness, they're rebuilding their homes. Something has just happened. Yeah. And so they decided that if they developed those relationships, so now they're reaching out to their community for the first time. They thought, oh my goodness, I'm watching this in front of my eyes. I didn't do anything except for develop a storyline and help them step into the story. They uh -huh. did it and so we have this building, and the anointing sheep steps in, and he sticks a blight into the forest. And I could see all the kids getting very upset and anxious. Well, they figured out because they knew farming take care of the blight. So they got together and they took care of the blight in the story. And then he came back in, the knowing sheep, and he put ticks on the goats. <laughs> and they, you could just see them getting more and more, and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I into? But they knew how to deal with that because they knew farming. Uh -huh. And so they took the problem. Then the annoying sheep comes back, just like in a folklore, and he burns the forest. He starts it on fire. And I looked around, kind of in horrified awe myself, and the kids went completely quiet. You could see the emotions rising, and at that moment, they turned directly to me, and they said, we don't need a judge, we don't need a police officer, we don't need a lawyer. And they turned around for the first time in a year. They turned to the perpetrator and said, this is our story. You have no right to do what she did. Good for them. And he was the perp in real life, too. Yes. And unfortunately, it was so powerful, and there were so many transformations at that point. We were never able to get together again, so I could never say the goodbyes I had hoped to say. But I heard about three years later, in fact, I was able to, to see members of the family again in, in, a, in a different context. It was not more than a month or two after that that they were reunited with the mother. Uh -huh. Just like in the story, they went back home. They reached out. They without the perp. Without the perp. Wonderful. How wonderful. <laughs> what a wonderful story. And it's a true one. It is. And that's where, that was the second huge revelation that we are the story. I could not have told this story or done what they did. Neither could they have done what I did. But together, we did something that went far beyond what anybody ever dreamed of. And they took that story, and that story changed in their lives as they stepped forward. So coming back to your original question and, and why the book has has so many different facets. It's for that therapist who may not know what else to do. But to do that, you need to have somewhat of a well-crafted story to hold your audience and to maintain that respect. For that teacher in the classroom that, you know, the kids are having a hard time with, with reading, which we're seeing more and more of because of the tweeting and chats and, and the wonderful gift of media, but also we're losing the images in our mind and stories are based from images. Mm -hmm. So for that teacher in the classroom, for that professional storyteller that, that's reaching out to new ways in the community and audiences that want to take their stories to another level and in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so there's that part of it that I did as in the role of a therapist. Okay. And then there's the role that, that I do sometimes with my daughter. My daughter's a professional dancer. She's beautiful. She is wonderful. It's an honor to continue to work with her. She is my coach. I would not be here today doing what I'm doing without my daughter because her knowledge of story I believe is much greater and much more expansive than mine mm -hmm. but currently there's two different things we do she teaches um, developmentally disabled children and adults story and mm -hmm. many of these um, and mostly adults many of these adults do not have the cognitive abilities to retain entire dance sequences mm -hmm. but if you're there to teach dance and she is a professional and that's what she's there to do dance requires a performance or a show there's a story to tell after dance class because you were a part of something in dance and so she invites me in and toward the end of her, her class series I come in with a story 
Uh-huh. And the students, based on her original choreography, become part of that story through dance. So we work together to make our own story. How wonderful. And, uh, oh, we're running out of time. Where can people buy your book? Um, uh, it. It is to be uh, should be out within the next two weeks, and then we'll find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, mm-hmm. as well as the Storyographer's website. Okay, and I would like to invite you to write a little something about you, what you do, or about story, or whatever you'd like for our TV backstory. That would be an absolute honor. Absolutely. Okay, so look for her Grace's article at tvbackstory.com. And thank you so much for being with us today. It was an honor. You're welcome. Thank you, Julia. Okay.